Good morning, Olean. It's good to see you. Happy birthday, by the way. That's why we're here to celebrate with you. I want to welcome our other locations as well as our online viewers. We're glad that you guys are with us as well. Let me ask you a question. Can't we all just get along? Isn't that a good question for churches? Wouldn't it be nice if all Christians and all churches just all got along? It's possible. The reality is we could if you would just agree with me. <laughs> right? I mean, isn't it true? If everyone just agreed with me, we'd all live in perfect unity and harmony, right? At least that's what people think in the church. And it's sad that so many churches are often known for, Christians really are often known for what they're against than what they're for. We're more known for disagreements and arguments and fighting, as we saw in that Google search last week during the message. That's what we're often known for. And it's not that we're never going to have disputes. It's not that we're never going to have disagreements. It's not that we're never going to fight. It's how we fight. Okay, so it's not that we have disagreements that we have different opinions. It's how we deal with those opinions that really makes a difference. Um, it reminded me of this joke I once heard. A guy was de deserted on a desert island. He was found, he was rescued. But when they rescued him, they noticed there was three homes, three huts. And they're like, I thought you were the only guy here. One guy, deserted island. Why do you have three homes? And he said, well, that's easy. This is my house, right? This is my church. That one over there, what's that over there? Well, that was my former church, don't ask, you know? <laughs> we fight, we fight. And yet, what we're gonna look at and see today is that this is not a new issue in the church. This has been happening from the very, very beginning of the early church. Go figure, right? Christians arguing about disputable matters. And so we have to know how to deal with these differing opinions if we are to stay unified and keep the main thing the main thing. So if you have your Bibles, Paul's going to address that in Romans chapter 14. We're going to read together this passage of scripture. Paul says this, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not quarrel over opinions. We're not to quarrel over Opinions, Paul says. The Greek word for um, quarrel right there, I think it's uh, something called a fakabuk, uh, Facebook, something like that. I think that's how you pronounce the, the Greek word. I'm just saying, just word of wisdom, stay off of arguments on Facebook. But he says, do not quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything. We'll just use a hypothetical example of me. I, I, I eat anything. While the weak person eats only vegetables. Any vegetarians at any of our locations? You should raise your hands uh, if you're a vegetarian. Don't be shy. Wow, I'm, I'm impressed, Olean. Like, zero. Okay. <laughs> For any vegetarians at the other campuses. I respect that. I really do. It's just a shame about your faith being so weak. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> If only this were a Bible verse to prove vegetarians wrong, but um, that's not Paul's point. Hope you know that. That's not Paul's point. Paul's point is, in matters of opinion, what we should never do is elevate them to the realm of absolutes. There's absolutes, there's convictions, there's preferences. Don't take the bottom two and put them up towards the realm of absolutes. That's what I think Paul is saying here. And then he says this in verse three, let, no, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. And here's why, for God has welcomed him. Here's the issue in the early church. There's a couple issues that he's gonna address in this passage and there's many other examples that fall thereafter that we can come up with in our own context. But the first issue that he addresses is what, what we're to eat. Because what was happening during that time is in the market, they would sell meat that was sacrificed to idols. And these Christians were wondering, should we eat it? Mainly Jewish Christians, because they, that was wrong in the law. So you can't do that. Or you were at, over someone's house. They had meat, a good steak, and it's calling out your name. It's like, oh, right? Yes, <laughs> Christian can relate. But... That meat, that steak was sacrificed to idols. So here's the question, should we eat it? Do we partake? 
Christian says yes. Gentiles were saying yes. Jewish believers, not so much. And so there's that tension. And I'm sure some were like, no, we can't eat that. That's sacrifice to idols. We don't want to honor Zeus. We don't want to honor this false god. And then other Christians were probably pointing to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. You remember what Paul says? He's like, there are no idols. The idols don't even exist. False gods, they're not real. Therefore, basically, eat up. Let's partake in this steak. And so there's this tension in the early church. Everybody say disputable matters. That's what we're talking about today. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about these matters of opinion in the early church, in, in, in our church. And then he says this in verse four. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Here's the question. Who are you? Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another person? Repeat this after me at all of our locations. It's not my job, not my job. To, be to be God. Can we all agree on that? It's not your job and it's not my job to be God. Our job is to love. His job is to judge. I think that's clear in this text. When we judge, we're essentially saying to other people and to God, uh, God, why don't you take some time out? You're not strict enough. I'm going to be, I'm going to take over, right? That's just stupid. That's not our job to be God. Verse five, one person esteems one day. So now he's switched from what we eat to, he's talking about days as better than another. Well, another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. It's interesting. He's talking about food. Does he answer the question whether or not to eat the meat? Does he answer that question? No. Does he answer the question about which days are more special? The answer is no. All Paul says is whatever you decide, because we're not talking about matters of salvation. We're talking about matters of opinion, disputable matters. Whatever you decide, what do we do? You got to be fully convinced, which if that were me, that would not be the approach I would take with disunity in the church, arguing and quarreling in the church. That's like pouring gasoline on a fire, right? You guys decide. Just be totally convinced, right? You would think that's what would happen. But, but imagine, imagine if everyone in our church was fully convinced about secondary matters of opinion because they had convictions. It's important to have convictions, but you did not allow those convictions to get into the way of the primary mission of sharing the gospel with other people so that people can experience the grace of God. Think about how powerful that message is to a divided world. I don't know if you realize that. Our world is a little bit divided. Country, a little bit divided, right? And it's gonna ramp up next year. Think about how powerful our witness is in a divided world when we stand in unison even in the midst of our diversity. You got different opinions? Great. Watch us love one another the way that this world will never, ever be able to love people who disagree with them. Now all of a sudden people pay attention. And I think that's one of the reasons why Paul just names a few issues in the church. I mean, he could have went on and on and on and on and on about other issues. There's thousands of issues that we could talk about today. I wrote a few of them down, but I don't think that's Paul's point. I think his point is even in the midst of your diversity, you gotta have unity because that unity sends a message of what the gospel is all about. He says, these days, what is he talking about? Sabbath days. One of them for like thousands of years, they met for church on Saturday because that's what the Jewish tradition was, the seventh day. And all of a sudden, Jesus is crucified, buried, raised from life, raised to life, and they start celebrating church on the first day, Sunday, which is what we do. Does that matter? I mean, these were real issues in the church. No, 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 it's gotta be the seventh day. No, we're gonna do it now a different way. And that was tension. Or festivals or holy days, 
that they partook in. Those were really important issues for us. Do we celebrate holidays, right? Disputable matters. We don't even have to get into that. But Paul's saying when you keep it about what Jesus' mission is, it totally changes what he's trying to get at in, in, in these verses. And then he says this in verse six. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord. Let's see if you pick up a little common thread here. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. What's the common thread? Honor. Thanks to who? You know what Paul's saying here? He, he, what he's, he's saying is the who is much more important than the what. Like motives really, really do matter behind what you do and the decisions that you make. It's true that two people could do the same exact thing in church, the same activity, and one be pleasing to God and the other not. You can show up to church on Sunday and sing, everybody's singing, and one person's voice and song is pleasing to God while the other person is not. How is that possible? Motives, heart, the why behind what you do, right? It's an important message for worship leaders while they lead worship. It's an important message for teachers while they teach. It's an important message for our kids' zone people. Why do we do what we do? Who is more important than the what? A great example in the Old Testament, if you know your Bible, is Cain and Abel, right? For all intents and purposes, they offer the same thing, offering. It's an offering to God. What they offered was not the same, but the action of what they did was the same. One was pleasing, while the other was not, because they didn't have the same motive. The opposite is also true, isn't it? Two people could do the exact opposite things, disputable matters, matters of opinion, you can decide this, and I can decide this, and both could be pleasing to the Lord. Both could be in honor of the Lord. Both could be thanks to the Lord because of your heart. All he says is be fully convinced. Be fully convinced. It's a matter of conscience. And then he says this in verse 7, for none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. I wish our church would get this. Cross on, I wish you guys would get this that when you were saved, you were not just saved individually, you were saved into the family of God. When you were saved, you weren't just saved personally, you were saved into a church family. And what you do matters, how you address matters matter, how you argue matters, how you treat one another matters, how you love one another matters. It's not about you. No one lives to himself and no one dies to himself. You were saved into a family, he says, for... He says, or I'm sorry, for if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Notice the contrast there. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. I don't think he could have come up with a, a bigger contrast between the two, right? We're talking about disputable matters. What's more opposite than life and death? And I think that's what he's trying to get at. Like, no matter what your opposition is, no matter what you're, you got, you're over here and you, this person's over here, he's saying, that's still not the point. It's the who. You are the Lord's, he says. For to this end, Christ died and lived again that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. I honestly think it, it, it cannot be pleasing to the Lord for us to claim you unison to him, unite, you know, being united to him, and yet be divided amongst ourselves. It's, it can't be that way. I mean, I just, it, it, over disputable matters, it can't be that way. It can't, it, he's not pleased when we're divided. That's why Jesus even prays in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. He says, Lord, make, Father, make them one as we are one. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Is Father, Son, Holy Spirit the same one God, but three distinct persons. Unity even within diversity. Make them one as we are one. He's praying for our unity, even in the midst of our diversity. Love. He goes on later in that passage of scripture in John 17, uh, 17 he says, they will know you are my disciples if you what? 
if you make really good arguments about the things that you are so convinced of, oh, they're not going to know. In fact, they probably will turn away. They will know that we are Christians by our what? Love. It's got to be about love. And then he says this in verse 10. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? That's such a strong word. And if you've been in church for any length of time, you probably can think of an example where you felt despised or you were the one despising. This is real emotion in the church. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. I want you to remember whose seat that is. It's God's judgment. It's Jesus' throne. It's Jesus' seat of judgment, not yours. Again, it's not my job to be God. And then he alludes to what uh, he also says in Philippians chapter 2. You might recognize these words. He says, for it is written, verse 11, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. If you know that passage of Scripture, which we'll look at in just a second, but this is the example where Jesus humbles himself, becomes obedient to the Father, and rather than focusing on his rights, and he had all kingly rights, he lays them down so that we could be right, so that we could receive the righteousness of God. So let me ask you a question. In, in regards to your preferences, your opinions, indisputable matters, this is what I think. If Jesus is willing to lay down his life, are we not willing to lay down our rights? Are we not willing to lay down our preferences for the sake of another believer, a brother? Or sister in Christ. Verse 12, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. I want you to read those verses again because if you're dealing with someone that's just really rubbing you the wrong way, really getting under your skin, isn't it freeing to know that at the end of the day, they don't answer to you, you don't answer to them. Who do we answer to? So just let God deal with them. You don't need to worry about them. You just worry about yourself. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not accountability within the Christian faith. There's certainly accountability that involves encouragement, being nice and loving, but I think it was Hebrews that talks about that we must, what, spur one another on? You know, like that visual? A cowboy on a horse just, get over here, brother, you know, like kicking him with a spur, right? Would you like that, Mark? No. But sometimes that's necessary when you see a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ going down the wrong path that's going to hurt them. Here's the difference between accountability and judgment, though. Accountability stands besides a believer and says, no, 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 <clears throat> You don't want to do that. You're going down the wrong path. I love you enough to tell you that. Because if you keep going, you're going to kill yourself. You're going to damage yourself. You're going to destroy your family. I, I'm not going to just let you do that just because I should keep to myself. No, I'm going to step in and love you. But that's the tone. The tone is love. It's not despite the tone is love. It's a posture of being alongside a brother. Judgment, in a sense, is standing against your brother. Essentially, what judgment is, is there's your brother, there's God, and you're just going to stand in the way between them both. And you're going to cast stones. It's a posture of not love, but it has the stench of spite. Just because, whatever, pride, you think you're better, you want to bring them down to your level. Whatever reason people give, and Paul doesn't really get into that, he just says, who are you to judge? Let him be on the throne judging other people. You will give an account to yourself. He says, take the telephone pole out of your own eye before you just try to deal with that speck in your brother's eye. In that sense, I, I like this illustration, but the Bible literally should be used as a mirror first before binoculars, right? Before I go encouraging you and spurring you on. I might want to pull this thing up and take a look at my own face. Maybe I got something in my own face, my own life, that's going to prevent me from speaking into your life effectively. And maybe I'm seeing something that's causing you to sin by what I do. And that's where Paul goes next. This is really good. Verse 13, therefore. So therefore means it's therefore a reason. Therefore, out of everything we just said, about not causing your weaker brother to sin and being sensitive to them and not quarrel over issues. He says, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a what? Stumbling block. A stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. In other words, he's saying, think about your brother. 
You know, we live in this individual type of culture where it's just about us. And we said earlier, Paul says that you're saved into a family, you're saved into a church, meaning that what you do actually matters and you can actually do something that might not even be in the area of sin. Might be okay for you to think, to act, or to do. But by doing that, you actually put a stumbling block in front of your brothers or sisters. Here's the question. Do, do you personally ever think before you act or make a decision or talk about how that, that decision is going to affect someone else? Because if you don't, if you kind of just like, you know, I'm free in Christ. I get to do whatever I want. That's not what Paul is saying here. That's not the point. He says, I know I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean. He goes back to food, right? Nothing is unclean in itself. But it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. How is that possible? How can something be clean and yet unclean at the same time? But he just said it's clean. He's convinced. He's persuaded it's clean. So then how can it be unclean? How can that food that was sacrificed to idols, that meat, be unclean then? And the answer is it's unclean for the person who's convinced that it's unclean. So whether it's clean or whether it's unclean is really not the point. That's irrelevant, isn't it? Isn't it irrelevant if you're right on a secondary matter, a matter of opinion, you can be 100% correct on that secondary opinion and be 100% wrong because you're causing your brother to stumble. In other words, if you take a secondary matter and elevate it to a primary issue, you've actually made that primary issue, Jesus, in second place. Does that make sense? You've caused them to violate their conscience. You've caused them to go against what they believe, whether they, whether they think if what they think is right or wrong, it's irrelevant. What are we doing and how do we, how do we interact with our brother and sister in Christ? Is it loving? Is it loving? Are we causing other people to stumble? Four, verse 15, if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. Like, you're really gonna grieve your brother or sister in Christ over what you eat? Are you really going to grieve your brother or sister in Christ by what you drink or what you think or what you do? Is that it? Are we going to have these arguments in the church and grieve each other? Or are we going to respond by walking in love? He says, by what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Isn't that heavy language, Paul? I mean, is it that serious? I mean, if you play that tape forward for a person who's violated their conscience, could it be that it's that serious? that how we interact with one another and cause others to stumble and fall, that we're destroying a brother or sister in Christ. There's a lot at stake here when we understand that. He says, for if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love by what you eat. Do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. He's saying people are much more important than secondary issues. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by man. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. The primary issue here in this text, if we get nothing else, the primary issue is how we deal with secondary matters. That's the issue. If you're just, I'm free in Christ, flaunting my freedom without consideration to your brother or sister in Christ, you're wrong. If you take secondary things, make them primary things, you're completely wrong. And Paul's warning us of that. I think it's funny that as we look at what it means to follow Christ, that Jesus calls us to lay down our lives and some of us can't even lay down our own opinions. We've missed it. He says, pursue peace, pursue mutual upbuilding. If the commandment to love other people has become secondary to your conviction to convince other people of your thing, 
You're missing the point of the gospel. You're missing what Jesus did. I don't know if you've really thought through the implications of this text, but can I just name a few? How about um, whether to homeschool or public school or private school your kids? Has anyone ever found a Bible verse in there about what you should do? Well, we, you know, we want to be in the world but not of the world. Ugh, what do you do? The Great Commission, go into the world and make disciples of all nations. Well, that's going to be hard to do if you're just keeping to yourself. Yeah, but we don't want them to kind of go down the wrong path and pursue evil. I get it. There's tension there, isn't there? You know, just, just for transparency, we, we have three boys in private school because we've been blessed with some, uh, some grants and stuff. Um, and then we have Aiden, who's now in ninth grade public school. Uh, if, in case you're wondering, we don't homeschool because the Bible does specifically say thou shall not murder. And we might, we might break that one if we had to homeschool. Some of you are saints. I'm just saying. Some of you are real saints if you homeschool because you have so much more patience than I do. But hey, we're not going to dispute over that stuff. Um, I've heard Christians argue about, you know, whether my wife's in fitness, whether or not yoga is okay. Yoga is from the devil because you're, supposed, you're meditating to someone. Well, that's not how they're approaching it. They're kind of just approaching it from a fitness point of view. And you can usually tell who thinks what by, you know, how involved they are in fitness. But, but who cares? Who cares? That's a secondary matter. If you're going to let that secondary matter, or how about essential oils? Now we're getting real, right? <laughs> yeah, someone say, no, 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 we don't do that. And then and the same people will say, well, why, why do you go to the doctor? Sorry, Dr. Keith, right? We, we don't even need doctors. You don't need medicine. Jesus is our healer. We don't need medicine. And so, listen, we can go on and on and on about this stuff. You want to talk about alcohol? <laughs> what about scripture translations? What about what day of the week does the church meet? Those evil Saturday Christians, they don't get it, right? Or Saturday, Sunday only Christians, God forbid. I think the devil's, I think the devil's strategy is to, to get Christians to meet on Wednesday nights for church because that'll really undo them, right? Come on. These are secondary matters of opinion that... I think we're laughing about because we've got great unity in our church for the most part, as I said last week. But this is like stuff, churches split over the color of the carpet. We've got like 50 shades in the carpet right here. Like they're squares. And then we got a random green one over there. If this was another church, we'd be gone. You wouldn't have lasted six years here in Olean, right? We're, we argue about these secondary matters and Paul's warning us. And then... And then he gives us, I'm going to jump ahead because I'm going too long, but he, he, he then gives us in chapter 15 the reason why, like the foundational reason why we need to get this right. And he uses the example of Jesus. I want you to hear these words. He says, we who are strong have an obligation to, to bear with the failings of the weak. Isn't that what Paul just talked about in chapter 14? So usually when you read the Bible, you go to a new chapter, it's like a new subject, right? He's carrying over his thought of what he just said. We have an obligation. If you are the person who's free in Christ, you can, everything is permissible, right? You also need to understand in that same chapter in 1 Corinthians 10 that Paul says, while everything is permissible, not everything is beneficial, right? You have an obligation to your weak brother who might be so confined by rules still, that they haven't experienced that freedom in Christ, to not make that brother or sister stumble. He says, you have an obligation not to please ourselves. Verse two, let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Why would you do that? Why would you not just think about yourself? We do live in America, right? Why would we think, why would we take time to think about the feelings, the perspective, the convictions of a weaker person who is not as mature in the faith and understands their freedom in Christ. Why would we even take time to do that? He answers the question in the next verse. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Remember I told you Philippians chapter two, this is what Paul writes in Philippians chapter two. Let's read it together. I'm gonna read it for you, but if you could put that on the screen there, guys. 
Philippians chapter two, verses four through eight says, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Keep going. Having this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, he's talking about Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Verse seven, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The reason we're not gonna put a stumbling block in front of another person, the reason we're not gonna quarrel about secondary matters, the reason why we're not gonna bring a secondary matter up to a primary thing and miss the primary matter, which is Jesus, is because Jesus is our example. Never forget, never forget that Jesus laid down his rights so that you could have righteousness. When you get into that argument with people about these things and you start confusing things, point back to Jesus. He's the one who humbled himself and became obedient to which he became a servant. And then he says this as we wrap up in verse four in Romans chapter 15. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance And through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may have one, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love this last verse. Therefore, okay? Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Unity, great fellowship, the type of fellowship that can take a church that was once 40 people in the Grace Alliance Church where you're sitting now, that caused it to split to 20 people, down to 10 people, when we first approached them seven years ago, that said, hey, What if we turned this ship around? What if we decided to do church a little bit different? What if we pulled all of our resources, which by the way, we had all the resources, they had none. And what if we did this thing together so that this community could hear the gospel of Jesus Christ? So that we wouldn't quarrel about secondary stuff, but we would make the main thing the main thing. Would you be in it? And you know, unfortunately, what they said. No. Be easier to close the doors. Thankfully, our district gave us this building and a group of 30 people who believed in this vision, along with Pastor Andy, came here to revitalize and to renovate this whole facility because they believed in the main thing, which is the gospel. We weren't gonna divide over secondary issues because Christ welcomed us. Unity and fellowship is really, really hard in the church. It literally splits churches up. And I think as we move forward, given the complexity of our church, we're already split up geographically, that we, we have to remember that it takes great endurance. It's not just great endurance, like six years, I'm still going strong. It's, it's like enduring one another. You have to endure one another. I don't like you some days. I don't like it. I don't like Pastor Andy some days. I have to endure him. You should pray for me. Or I love the other guys, but I love everyone. But it takes endurance, doesn't it? Christian faith and fellowship takes endurance. And he says, endure one another. And here's the picture he gives, harmony. I'm not a musician. Maybe Alyssa could talk to this. But harmony is what? It's it's intentionally singing different notes on purpose so that you'd make better music, right? Did I get it right? It's, it's essentially within diversity, embrace diversity so that you'll have a better, more beautiful outcome. That's a, that's a great picture of the church. We're singing different notes. We're talking about different things. I've got this conviction, you got that conviction. That's cool, as long as we're keeping Jesus at the center of what we do. It's about the Great Commission, not our own personal secondary convictions. And when we miss that, we don't have harmony. He says, welcome each other. How? As Christ has welcomed you. Do you ever think about how Christ welcomed you? Did you you deserve it? Did you earn it? 
Did that person that you're struggling with to have fellowship with, to love, did they deserve it? Did they earn it? It's pretty irrelevant when you understand how Christ welcomed you. Christ laid down his life for you when you were not lovable. Where, where you didn't have anything good in you, he pulled you out of the pit of hell. He set your feet on the rock. He gave you new life. And as we follow him, we better be willing to lay down our rights, our preferences, our privileges for the sake of other people. Amen? I want to invite our um, worship teams to um, come forward. At our other locations, here we get to celebrate baptisms, so that's exciting. Let me pray for us as a church. Lord, I pray for these, um, these issues that often come up, whether we have uh, opinions about alcohol or dancing, music, what music we should have in church, what Bible translation, the decor of the building, uh, what movies we can and should watch, how we educate our kids. There's so many, what we should eat, what we should not eat. What days are special as in the early church? There were so many issues that caused them to quarrel. And your message to them was get along. Get along. Welcome each other as Christ has welcomed you. Pray that that would be our heart. Pray that that would be our vision as we move forward. And Lord, I pray for, for people in here that are much more mature in the faith, that do understand the scriptures a little bit better, that do understand that we're free in Christ, that everything is permissible in these secondary things, that we would keep in mind the weaker brother, that we wouldn't cause anyone to stumble so to destroy them. God, that's not our heart. We desire unity, fellowship, and harmony here at Crosstown, and we ask that you would allow us to do that. And it's in Jesus' name we ask this. Amen.